Hello and welcome everybody to what is the very first virtual St Hilda's Garden Party event. We are so delighted that everybody can join us today and we hope that this is a success despite the fact that the situation is extremely abnormal. Uh, my name is Dr Daniel Bulty, I'm an engineering fellow at St Hilda's and it is an absolute delight and a privilege to be introducing Dr Luke Ju, who is one of our physics tutors who is going to be speaking to us today about parallel universes, the facts behind the fiction. Now, Luke is not only a fellow at Hilders, he's actually an alumnus of St Hilders as well. He spends most of his time uh, as in his day job as a cosmologist, which means he's looking at really simple, basic questions like, how did the universe begin? And often spends a lot of his time trying to improve the baby photos that we take of the universe so that we can really understand it much better. But rather than me going on, you're all here to see him and hear about his work. So I'd like to pass over directly to Luke. Um, I'm just as excited as I'm sure as everybody else to hear what you've got to say today. Thank you, Dan. So hopefully this is going to work. Fingers crossed. OK, I think we're good to go. So the physics of parallel universes. Is there a, another copy of you living on a planet called Earth listening to, the, to this talk, their planet and their life, identical to yours in every single way up until this moment, where they decide that actually this talk looks like it's going to be rather dull and boring, so they turn off their computer and do something else instead? What about copies of you living in universes with magic, where time runs differently or some event from history never happened? The idea of parallel universes is exciting, mind-bending, and a very useful literary device. It's been used in fiction for centuries. Examples include Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy, where Lyra and Will slip between universes. C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, where time runs differently in a world accessed through a wardrobe. And the movie Sliding Doors, starring Gwyneth Paltrow, where we see how her life changes depending on whether she just catches or just misses her train. And finally, every third episode of Star Trek, so what does physics have to say on the matter of parallel universes? The important thing to point out is that there isn't a theory of parallel universes. Rather, lots of well-accepted theories predict the existence of parallel universes. And so it would be unsurprising if we, got, if we were so wrong on so many things and parallel universes do not exist in some way. Lots of people have tried to classify and categorize the parallel universes that are predicted by physics. And I think that the best categorization is Tejmark's hierarchy of universes. And so it's the framework we're gonna to follow today when we're talking about some of these ideas. And then at the end, I'm gonna draw a bit of extra attention to some ideas that, that are technically included in this hierarchy, but I think they sort of, they slip under the radar a little bit and, and really have their own identity. So we're going to start by talking about level one parallel universes, also known as patchwork universes, before moving on to level two bubble universes. We're then going to talk about the next level of parallel universes that are introduced by the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. We'll talk about level four parallel universes and the snappiest title I could come up with for them are other mathematical structures, which doesn't really roll, roll off the tongue and isn't particularly poetic, um, but it's a cool idea nonetheless before finally talking about some of these other ideas that don't quite fit into the hierarchy. So computer simulations and, and extra spatial dimensions. So let's start with our level one patchwork universes. The idea is that there are an infinite number of parallel universes. And that if you got in a spaceship and traveled in some direction for long enough, eventually you would reach one of these parallel universes. Essentially, it's that the idea is that the universe is made up of repeating random units. And, and to get this kind of parallel universe, we don't have to invoke any strange physics whatsoever. So according to the simplest, most widely tested cosmological model that scientists have come up with, there is an identical version of you sitting about 10 to the power 10 to the power 29 meters away. Um, this is an absolutely mind-bogglingly -boggling, huge number. If you wanted to write this number out in full, so instead of using this notation I've used, well, I've raised 10 to the power 10 to the power 29, if you wrote like one and then an awful lot of zeros, there are not enough and never will be enough pencils in all of existence to write this number out. So it's a huge distance away, but 
there is another one of you sitting probably this far away listening to this talk right now. So where does this number come from? What does it mean? And, and what on earth is going on? So you existing is a rather unlikely event. If you think of all the twists and turns of fate that resulted in the seven billion, billion, billion atoms that make up you coming together in just the right way, well, it's just not very likely. A slightly more likely event that we can think about is me winning the lottery. At least I like to think it's more likely. If I bought myself a lottery ticket, the chance of me winning is about one in 45 million. So if I played twice a week for 400,000 years, I'd expect to win once. I could play it a few more times, right? So let's say I played it twice a week for the entire age of the universe. If I did that, I'd expect to win about 32,000 times. So very rare events do happen. And if you have lots of possible attempts, they can happen an awful lot of times. So if the universe is, is infinitely big, it means that even the most unlikely events must happen somewhere. And if they happen somewhere, they must also occur an infinite number of times. So if the universe is infinite, there are an infinite number of versions of you and versions similar to you sitting here right now trying to remember whether they bought a lottery ticket. The question comes, is the universe infinite? And to answer that, we turn to something called the cosmic microwave background. So this, I'll explain to you what I've just shown you on your screen. Um, our universe is about 14 billion years old. And so we can only see as far out as light has had time to travel. Um, so because of the expansion of the universe, we, we can actually see a bit further than 14 billion light years. So light travels at the speed of light, and you might naively assume that if the universe is 14 billion years old, we could see 14 billion light years away. But because our universe is expanding, you can actually see about 40 billion light years away. We can see things a bit further than that. What I'm showing you here is the radiation coming from right at the edge of as far as we could see. So we look around in every single direction and measure this cosmic background radiation, cosmic microwave background radiation, and it forms a shell all around us with a radius of about 40 billion light years. Now, a spherical shell, I can't show you on a flat screen. So what I've done is sliced it open and squidged it flat in, in the same way that you might a map of the world. Um, so important thing to realize is just because we can't see further than 40 billion light years doesn't mean that there's nothing actually beyond it, right? We just have the light from there hasn't had time to reach us yet. Now measuring the, the pattern of blobs in this funny looking image of the oldest light in the, in the universe can tell us not just how large our observable universe is, but also actually tell us things about how large the whole universe is. The first way is through this idea called spatial curvature. Spatial curvature is a value that tells us about the shape of the universe. It can be negative, it can be zero, or it can be positive. And quite often it's easier to think about these kind of shapes, not in the, the three dimensions that we live in, but rather in two dimensions. And then you sort of sit and think about it for a while and, and, it, and it kind of twigs in higher dimensions. So let's talk about the negative spatial curvature. In 2D, the equivalent is living on the surface of a sphere, like the Earth. So the Earth, if you just, all of us, which we do, live on the surface of the sphere, this is a negatively curved surface. And on the Earth, pairs of parallel lines don't stay the same distance apart forever. They eventually cross. If you look at this globe, around the equator are parallel lines of longitude, but they cross at the poles. And another cool thing about a curved surface like this is that if you set off in one direction and, and start traveling, eventually you would come back on yourself. You'd come back to where you started. So this means that something with negative curvature is finite. It does not go on forever. The 3D equivalent of this walking all the way around the world and coming back on yourself is getting in a spaceship, picking a direction, traveling it, um, and eventually getting back to where you started. So if you did that, the universe would be finite. It would not go on forever and that's a negatively curved universe. So if it's negatively curved, we can tell that from this image. The physics that underpins the shape and distribution of the blobs on this funny looking picture are actually really well understood. It's things like plasma physics, electromagnetism, uh, some, a bit of general relativity. It isn't complicated, well, 
it's complicated computer equations that, that solve the that's complicated computer programs that solve these equations for us, but there's, we don't have to put anything weird in to get this out. And so we can predict how big we think these blobs should look. If the universe were negatively curved, because pairs of parallel lines eventually cross, it ends up making these blobs look bigger than, than, we, than they otherwise would be. And so we can compare how big the blobs look to how big our, our simulations tell us they should be um, and see if there's any difference. And there isn't any difference. So this is telling us that the, the curvature of our universe is actually very close to zero. We live in what's called a flat universe. This number at the bottom is just sort of the latest best constraint on the curvature of our universe in some weird, in this parameterization. And it's completely consistent with zero. Okay, so it seems that our universe has a flat curvature um, or doesn't have any curvature, it is flat. And flat universes, it's kind of 50-50 whether they go on forever or they don't. It's 50-50 whether they are infinite or finite. So let's explore flat universes and whether they go on forever and whether they don't. So flat universes are quite appropriately named. The 2D equivalent of a flat universe is a piece of paper. And on a piece of paper, pairs of parallel lines stay the same distance apart forever. It's the geometry that you learned at school, angles in a triangle adding up to 180 degrees. And in such a flat universe, you could just keep traveling forever and ever and ever, and you'd never come back on yourself and you'd never hit a wall or a boundary. But we can take flat pieces of paper and we can, we can bend them in clever ways and make them loop back on themselves. Um, and one way of doing this is called a Mobius strip. So this is something if you wanted to, you could look up later um, and have a go at making your own Mobius strip. And so whilst this looks curved, mathematically, it's still a flat space. And that's because pairs of parallel lines would stay the same distance apart. We haven't done anything to pairs of parallel lines. But it means that if we traveled for long enough, eventually we'd come back on ourselves. We could travel all the way around the Mobius strip and we'd end up coming back to where we started. So if the universe did this, it wouldn't be infinite, it would be finite. And again, we can try and determine whether the universe is sort of bent up in a Mobius strip or not by looking at this funny pattern of blobs in the oldest light in the universe. So if the universe repeated on itself, we would expect to see that, right? We would expect to see some repeating patterns or somewhere where there was a very bright object we would expect also to see the same bright object again, another like length of the universe behind it and again and again and again, and that would make bright objects look brighter. And we don't see evidence for any of this happening. And it enables us to put constraints on how big the universe has to be. So currently this light that we're seeing here is coming from bits of the universe that are 40 billion light years away from us. Because we don't see any repeating patterns, we know that the, the entire universe is at least 10 times bigger still. So we can only see out to 40 billion light years, but it's actually at least 400 billion light years big. Okay, so the universe is completely consistent with being infinitely big, but I've not proved that it definitely is yet. And Interestingly, there are other theories that are needed to explain certain problems in physics and to make the universe work that actually require the universe to be infinitely big. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. So my answer to is the universe infinitely big is oh, probably with a couple of question marks. So we, we probably live in an infinitely big universe. So let's Let's take that, we live in an infinitely big universe and let's draw a diagram of what the patchwork universes would look like. So on the left, that arrow is pointing to our earth. And then on the right, there's another arrow pointing to a completely identical earth to our own. So it's, you know, that 10 to the power 10 to the power 100 meters away or whatever it was, a completely identical earth to our own. Our universe is only about 14 billion years old, so we can't see all of it yet the light hasn't had time to reach us. So we can only see this, this 80 billion diameter sphere around ourselves. As time goes on, we will be able to see more and more distant patches of the universe because the light has had time to reach us. So over time, the size of our observable universe will expand until eventually that other identical earth to our own slips this side of the veil and we can see it. Importantly, we wouldn't be looking at this other earth 
as it is sort of right now, but rather we'd be seeing it as it was when its light was released. So this would be a, an absolutely amazing resource for historians in the distant future, being able to see other exact replicas of our earth um, evolving through time. So we would see the, the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. We would see the ancient Egyptians building the pyramids and people in the far future would be able to see people in the 19th, 20th and 21st century destroying their planet with pollution and emitting greenhouse gases. So how did we get to this number that I, that I quoted at the start, that there's an identical version of you sitting 10 to the power 10 to the power 29 meters away, this number that's so big there would never be enough pencils in all of existence to write it out in full? Well, actually, it's using physics um, that second year undergraduates can do. So I was teaching this to them a couple of months ago. Um, for any for any physics undergrads listening, or anyone interested in doing a physics undergraduate degree, the, there are basically two steps to this. The first is you work out how many protons you can pack into a given volume at temperatures less than about 100 million Kelvin. So a proton is just one of the particles that makes up uh, atoms. So you work out how many protons, how many possibly different states you could put a proton in inside a given volume. And then each of those possible states that you could put a proton in either does or does not have a proton. Um, so that, that then you just do a tiny bit of maths and this, this plops out. So that's where this comes from. And I assumed that you, I, we, to make the numbers easy, our, the volume of a human body is about one cubic meter. But we could, an exact replica of you isn't the same as a parallel universe. So there could be an exact replica of you sat in your living room listening to this talk. There could be an exact replica of you sat on a beach enjoying the sunshine. Um, there could be an exact replica of you floating through the vacuum of space, wondering how you suddenly got into the vacuum of space. Um, so maybe we want a slightly bigger patch of the universe to be exactly the same, rather than just the cubic meter of volume that you occupy, maybe we want like a hundred light year sphere. So we want you and everything out to a hundred light years to be exactly the same. If you do that, you end up getting a bigger number, 10 to the power 10 to the power 91 meters, which is another completely uncomprehensibly large number. But that distance away, there is probably another hundred light year sphere that's exactly the same as our own. So what does that mean? It means that the history for the exact replica of you in this 100 light year sphere will be the same for the next 100 years. Because if in that 100 light year sphere, everything's the same, there's nothing that can get to you that's any different. We could go a bit bigger still. So let's say we want um, our current observable universe, which is 40 billion light years in radius. We want that sphere. Well, you'd have to go 10 to the power 10 to the power 115 meters away to expect to get a replica of our current observable universe. Now, all of these are unimaginable distances. And this is, I don't know if you can have something that is even, oh, sharing is paused. Hopefully I've come back. I'm going to assume that I've come back unless Harris sends me a text message telling me otherwise. Um, so what was I saying? Unimaginably large distances. Um, yeah, humongous distances away. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Right. So how would we get between these patchwork universes? You'd either have to get in a spaceship for a very long time or find a shortcut through space. And the classic example of this is a wormhole, a shortcut through space. So what are the caveats to this level one patchwork universes about whether they exist or not? So we, we have to assume that the universe is infinitely big for it to work. And we can, we can physicists do indeed test whether that's the case. We've also assumed that the laws of physics are the same everywhere. Now, astronomers make an awful lot of observations to test this. And so far, all the evidence says that the laws of physics are indeed the same everywhere. So this is real science, it's testable. If we discovered that the universe had curvature or was flat but folded up like a Mobius strip, um, it would rule level one parallel universes out. Similarly, if the laws of physics were found to change um, in different places in the universe, again, it would likely rule out these patchwork universes. So this is real science, um, it's not sort of made up. Okay, so that was our level one 
parallel universes where we introduce this idea of there being an infinite number of identical copies of ourselves. I now want you to imagine an infinite number of, an infinite number of parallel universes, um, which is a little bit mad. So these two mugs show, each show an equation. And these two equations basically explain all of natural sciences. You can derive all of the natural sciences from the equations written on these two mugs. On the left, we have the standard model of particle physics, and on the right, we have Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, you have to throw in something like 35 constants, so you, you have, there are 35 numbers hidden in these equations that you have to set just right, um, and you get our universe and our physics. The main problem is the fine-tuning of those constants. So, for example, let's take the strength of the electromagnetic force. So this is the force between magnets or between charged particles. That constant is buried somewhere deep in the left-hand mug. If the electromagnetic force were, say, 4% weaker, our sun would immediately explode because diprotons would have a, a stable bound state. If it were just a little bit stronger, there'd be far fewer stable atoms. So slight changes can give us vastly different universes that we likely couldn't live in. Physicists hate these so-called fine tuning problems. Why are they exactly the values they are rather than some other value? Now, there is a theoretical solution to this problem called cosmic inflation. Now, cosmic inflation also explains a whole host of other problems um, in modern physics that we don't really have time to go into today. One of its predictions is that the universe should be infinitely big, and I used to work on trying to find direct evidence that this cosmic inflation occurred. But one of cosmic inflation's predictions also happens to be um, that these bubble universes should exist. So what is cosmic inflation? Let's focus on a little bit of history of the universe, I think the most important bit of history in our universe, and that's right at the start, the tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So right after the Big Bang, our current observable universe that's 40 billion light years in radius, 80 billion light years in diameter, was squished down to be much, much smaller than an atom. Cosmic inflation happened, and for a tiny fraction of a second, for about 10 to the power minus 34 seconds, which is one millionth of one billionth of one billionth of one billionth of a second, the universe expanded faster than the speed of light. So I'll kind of say that again, because it's a weird idea. We were all taught at school that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And yet here I am a physicist telling you that to make the universe work, it has to have expanded faster than the speed of light. Um, you sadly just have to accept that. If you want the universe to work, it has to have briefly expanded faster than the speed of light. And in that tiny fraction of a second, it ballooned from being much, much, much smaller than an atom to about the size of a pink grapefruit. So you could have held our entire observable universe that today is 80 billion light years across in the palm of your hands. And for some reason, when the universe was about a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old, cosmic inflation stopped. We don't know why, but it did. And then after that point, the universe con continued to evolve much more slowly. So the universe did continue to expand, but a much slower rate, not faster than the speed of light. And gravity went on to pull things together to form stars and galaxies and planets and ultimately people. Um, but the big question is what caused the cosmic inflation to stop? Why did the universe stop expanding faster than the speed of light? And then I guess the next question you could ask is, what if that rapid growth didn't stop everywhere at the same time. To understand this, I think you need to think about boiling water. So if you imagine so a pot of boiling water, as the water heats up, bubbles are randomly created. And at the edge of the bubble, we convert more water into steam and the bubble expands. The analogy then starts to break down because we also have to think of the, the water itself also expanding very quickly and dragging the bubbles away from one another. And that makes collisions between the bubbles unlikely, but they still can happen. So each bubble corresponds to a patch of the multiverse where cosmic inflation has stopped and a universe has started. Each bubble universe, when it gets created, has physical constants set to random values. And this solves the fine tuning of the constants of the laws of physics. All possible values are realized or used somewhere. Um, and it's just, you know, we happen to find ourselves in a universe with the values that we have. Um, and it's therefore unsurprising that we find ourselves in a universe 
with where the laws of physics allow us to exist. In fact, it would be surprising if we found ourselves in one of these bubbles with laws of physics that made it impossible for us to exist. So because the constants are different in these bubble universe, physics looks different. It's the same fundamental equations in the background, but by changing the constants, you get different behavior. And I think one of the most interesting things to, to play with is the number of spatial dimensions. So we live in a universe with three spatial dimensions. We can go forwards and backwards, left and right, or up and down. Let's consider a universe with just two spatial dimensions. In two spatial dimensions, it would be a bit like living on a map. There is no, comp in, in two dimensions, you can't have complexity. So if you look at this map, there's a river with some bridges crossing it. In three dimensions, we build a bridge by going above the flow of the water. So we're making use of the third dimension so that the water can cross underneath and people can go over the top. In two dimensions, you can't go over the water. You just end up with the, the water and the bridge crashing into one another. And so if you can't build bridges, you can't build life that's similar to the life we know in any way. We rely on things being able to pass one another without crashing. So veins and arteries need to be able to pass one another and not just have the blood confusingly go everywhere. Um, so in two dimensions, you would probably struggle to get life that is in any way similar to us and you, you very much struggle to get complexity. Let's now consider going the other way. So we have three spatial dimensions. Let's think about universes with more than three spatial dimensions. Um, in 3D, our universe, we rely on stable circular orbits. What's a stable circular orbit? Consider the Earth orbiting the sun. It's orbiting in roughly a circle. If you nudge the Earth a little bit, it's not going to crash into the sun and burn up, and nor is it going to fly off into the cosmos. It will just be a perhaps slightly less circular orbit, but it will continue orbiting the sun. Similarly, we rely on circular orbits when you think about electrons orbiting the nuclei of atoms. Um, so existence as we know it completely depends on circular orbits being stable. In more than 3D, there are no stable circular orbits. And interestingly, we actually use this as an undergraduate admissions interview question, uh, Christmas just gone, uh, we sort of walked them through to try and get to get them to show that you can't get stable circular orbits in more than three dimensions. It was a little bit of a difficult question, but we got some very good answers from it. Something you may have come across is an idea called string theory. And string theory attempts to unify those two mugs. So the mug that was Einstein's theory of general relativity and the mug that was um, the standard model of particle physics, at the moment, they're two separate mugs. String theorists would ideally like there to be just one mug. Um, and to, to, so to unify these two branches of physics requires them to say, actually, there must be more than three dimensions. So depending on your string theorist, there might be 11 dimensions that you have to play with. But in 11 dimensions, there wouldn't be stable circular orbits, which we observe. And so their kind of get out of jail free card is that maybe these extra dimensions are really tightly bound up on themselves. Or maybe it requires huge amounts of energy to travel in one of these, one of these extra dimensions. And interestingly, this is one of the ways that characters in Philip Pullman's novels can travel between universes. Using the huge amounts of energy released by separating a demon from its human, you could maybe kick yourself in one of these extra dimensions and use it to get to a parallel universe. So in more, in, when you start playing with the numbers of dimensions, this is where you start to get magic as well. And I think, again, the easiest way to talk about this is by first thinking of a two-dimensional universe. And then if you, something you find interesting, you should sit underneath a tree with a glass of wine or a cup of tea and think about it for a while. And eventually it clicks into place. So let's say we've got a 2D universe where, where some creatures do exist. I know I said that you can't get complexity, but let's say somehow life can still exist in a two-dimensional universe. And let's say those two-dimensional beings build the most perfect safe imaginable in their universe. And they put inside the safe all of their valuables. So the safe is, the valuables are completely surrounded by an impenetrable wall and the creatures can't get in to remove the valuables. Higher dimensional beings, such as ourselves that exist in three dimensions, we can reach into their most secure of safes and lift out their valuables um, by traveling through a dimension that they cannot use. 
Similarly, we could reach inside the two dimensional creatures and fix a damaged organ all without having to cut them open. So that's in two dimensions. You now have to extend this to, to three dimensions. So let's say that there is a fourth dimension that we cannot travel through. Even our most secure of safes would not be, would be completely vulnerable to someone that could make use of a fourth dimension. One of the things I said earlier when I, when I was explaining this bubble universe is I said to think about a pot of boiling water and the bubbles expanding um, and that the hot water itself also expanding so the bubbles get dragged away from one another. And I said that it makes collisions between the bubbles very unlikely, but in principle, they could still happen. Such a collision would leave a mark on this cosmic microwave background, radiation, the oldest light in our universe. These are simulations that show what such a collision would look like, the kind of impact it would leave on the cosmic microwave background. So at the bottom here is simulations. And you see that the simulated effect kind of looks like some blobs that look very similar to all the other blobs that are in the cosmic microwave background. So it's very tough to tell um, if there is evidence or if there isn't of these kind of bubble universe collisions. And a decade or two ago, people started to get very exciting, excited, thinking that they'd seen evidence of these collisions between bubble universes. Um, but with better data, the evidence for them went away. Um, so that was something people used to be excited by. So we've just gone through our level one parallel universes, the patchwork universe, where if you travel in some direction for long enough, you'll hit an identical version of yourself and our world and our current observable universe. We then introduce the idea of bubble universes. So that's an infinite number of an infinite number of universes. And each of the bubbles would have the same equations governing the physics, but different constants in the equations that made the physics look different. The level three parallel universes come from rather than like the biggest scales in the universe and cosmology, but rather from the smallest, from quantum mechanics. And interestingly, they result in universes or, or parallel universes that are quite similar to the level one patchwork universes. So in the next five slides or so, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about quantum mechanics. And that will enable us to hopefully understand where this many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics comes from, what it means, um, and, and that it ultimately leads to the idea of there being lots of parallel universes. So quantum mechanics 101. Most people have entire lecture courses on this. You're getting five minutes. So there's three things we have to appreciate before we can get going. The first is that physics is random. Physics tells us that the universe is random. And in normal life, we handle randomness using probabilities. So when I was talking about playing the lottery, I said the chances of me winning were one in 45 million. Quantum mechanics doesn't use probabilities per se, but rather probability amplitudes. So quantum mechanics creates these things called probability amplitudes. And to get probabilities, we have to square the amplitude. So we times probability amplitudes by themselves, and that gives us probabilities. And so here is a maths warning. And I know that some people can be put off or scared or, or turned off when they start to see equations. But I'm, I promise you that it's really worth it. If you, if you stick with me here and follow what I'm saying, we'll go through some equations that perhaps look a bit mad, but will hopefully make sense. And by the time we get to the end, you will then hopefully understand quantum mechanics and also why it leads to the idea of it resulting in an infinite number of parallel universes. So let's get going. We're gonna start by thinking about Schrodinger's cat. And I'm sure that some of you have heard of the idea of Schrodinger's cat. The idea is you get a box, inside the box, you put a cat. You also put a vial of poison connected to an atom that has a 50% chance of decaying. If the atom decays, the poison gets released and the cat dies. If the atom doesn't decay, the poison stays in the vial and the cat is alive. So put all these things in the box, we seal the lid, there's a 50% chance of the poison being released, and when we open it, we find that either the cat is alive or the cat is dead. So let's use quantum mechanics to work out the probability that the cat is alive. Now, I've kind of already told you that there's a 50% chance of the poison being released and the cat living or, or dying. So this is perhaps going to seem like an awful lot of work to show you something that you already know, but we can then use the tools we develop here on a slightly more complicated example 
that leads to this idea of parallel universes. Okay, so the first bit of maths we can introduce is the idea of a wave function. So this funny thing on the left that you're seeing here is how math mathematicians write down this thing called a wave function. It's a Greek letter with a straight line on one side and a bendy line on the other side. Now the wave function just contains all the information about a system. So in, this in, in the example of our cat in a box, it tells us, it contains the information about the cat's energy, the cat's position. It tells us if the cat was spinning around. Bizarrely, quantum mechanics really cares if things are spinning around or not. Um, it's just all the information. And it's a shorthand because otherwise, anytime we wanted to do any maths, we'd have to write down every single thing that we knew about the cat or the, or the system or the box. And this way is just a shorthand to say all the information about the system. Okay. When the box is closed, we don't know if the cat is alive or dead. And so we need all the information. We need the information about the cat being alive and the information about the cat being dead. Otherwise, we're gonna be missing out some possible outcomes. And so we basically just add together the wave functions. We add together all the information. So the smiley faced cat with a straight line and the bendy line is the wave function of the cat being alive. And the skull and crossbones with the straight line and the bendy line is the wave function of the cat being dead. And then we just have to divide each of them by the square root of two. This is just to normalize things and make things work. It, it doesn't matter um, for the sake of understanding what's going on. Okay, so to work out the probability that the cat's alive, we need to work out the quantum mechanics probability amplitude, which I said we would then square to get the probability. Now the amplitude is the overlap between the wave function we're interested in and the wave function of the system. By overlap, I mean how similar the two wave functions are, how consistent are the two states with one another. We're interested in the cat being alive. So we want to see how the cat overlap, the cat's wave function overlaps with the wave function of the entire system. Clearly, the overlap between the cat being alive and the cat being alive is one. These two statements are completely consistent with one another. There's no difference in the information. Clearly, the overlap between the cat being alive and the cat being dead is zero. These two states are mutually exclusive of one another. The cat cannot be alive and dead. Bear with me on this. Okay, this looks scary. It's not, I'm gonna walk you through it really slowly. This is the maths. So the top line is what we already said is the wave function of our system. It's the wave function of the cat being alive added to the wave function of the cat being dead. We want the probability of the cat being alive, which is the overlap between the wave function of the cat being alive and the wave function of the system. And then we have to square it to get a probability out. I said earlier that the overlap of the cat being alive with the cat being alive was one, and the overlap of the cat being alive with the cat being dead is zero. So then this penultimate line of the equation here um, is one over the square root of two is about 0 0.7. So we have 0 0.7 times one, which is 0 0.7, plus 0 0.7 times zero, which is zero. So we have 0.7 squared, which is 0.7 times 0.7, and that's basically a half. And so the probability of our cat being alive when we open the box is 50%, which we kind of already knew given the question. This seems like an awful lot of weird and confusing work to tell you something that was perfectly clear to you from the start. Lots of people, when they're talking about Schrodinger's cat, use it as an example to say, oh, no, this means that the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. And to me, Schrodinger's cat, it's, the thought experiment doesn't make it obvious that that's the case. Nothing that we have done here makes it explicit that the cat has to be alive and dead at the same time. So the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which we're gonna do another example in a second of to, to really hammer home why this is the case, says that when we put the cat in the box, the universe splits and the cat is alive and dead at the same time because there are multiple universes. And in some of them, the cat's alive and in others, the cat is dead. When we open the box, the universe decides which of those possible splits we find ourselves in. So as I said, let's use the math we've just practiced on a slightly more difficult example to ultimately show that the universe splits every time it has to make a decision. And we're gonna do that using uh, something called the double slit experiment. So the idea of the double slit experiment is we have a light and we turn it on and we shine it at a pair of narrow slits. 
And as the light passes through the narrow slits, those new waves of light interfere with one another and will leave a pattern that we can measure on a screen. Okay, if the light just went through a single slit, you would see a pattern of light on the screen that looks like what I've shown you at the top. If it goes through two slits and the light can interfere with itself, you end up with this pattern at the bottom with a rapid oscillating between bright patches and dark patches. So, okay, light's a wave. We've got constructive and destructive interference causing this pattern. Light is also a particle. And we can do this one particle at a time, one photon of light at a time. We're going to fire a photon at the pair of slits. The photon will pass through one of the slits. We don't know which. And this is equivalent to the cat being alive and dead at the same time. The photon will then hit the screen on the other side. If we fire photons through particles of light through one at a time, we still get the, the funny pattern at the bottom, the interference even though there were no other photons of light for it to interfere with. And we even get this with atoms and molecules. So you might naively expect here, instead of light, I'm firing particles through the slit, say electrons or atoms or molecules. You might naively expect to, on the screen, get two piles of, of electrons or atoms building up. One at the top corresponding to particles that travel through the top hole, and one at the bottom corresponding to the particles that travel through the bottom hole. What we actually see is the same quickly oscillating pattern of light and dark um, that we saw for the, for the waves. So this is still happening with particles. In fact, it even happens or would happen with people. So if you fired people fast enough at incredibly narrow holes, you would, well, you would make a horrible mess and you might naively expect to get two disgusting piles of mushed up bits of human, one at the top corresponding to people that were squeezed through the top hole and one at the bottom corresponding to people squeezed through the bottom hole. But actually you would still get this same funny pattern of this kind of interference, even though you were firing one person at a time. So let's do a similar trick to what we did for the cat. So at the top here, we've got the wave function. So that Greek letter in the, with the straight line in the bendy line is um, one over square root of two times the wave function for going through the top hole, which I've signified with the up arrow, added to the wave function of going through the bottom hole, which I've signified with the down arrow. We don't know which of the holes it went through, so we have to include both pieces of information. We're interested in um, the probability of a particle that passes through one of the slits or a person that's been smashed into this strange apparatus, we're interested in um, how likely the particles or the, the bits of person are to land at different heights. So if Z is our height up the screen, we're interested in what's the probability distribution of the heights, the probability of Z. And we work that out by squaring the overlap of the wave functions. How consistent are they with one another? Now, unlike the cat case, um, which had two possible neat outcomes, here we have here we have an infinite number of possible outcomes. So um, previously we had the overlap of cat alive with cat alive was one, and the overlap with cat alive and cat dead was zero. Here, if you go through the top hole, you can reach all possible heights. So the overlap of Z, the height, with the up arrow, the top hole, is not one or zero, it's actually something more complicated. And similarly, for the overlap of the height with the bottom hole, it's not one or zero, it's something more complicated. Um, so let's do the maths. This is the maths we did before, so we want the probability distribution of Z, okay. Um, we expand out the brackets, and previously this was made nice because one of the one of the overlaps was one, the other one was zero. Here it's not. So if you just do some, think it back to your A-level maths and you expand out the brackets, we end up with a few different terms. These two terms here correspond to getting two piles of particles. This is what you would naively expect if you didn't do any quantum mechanics. But on the right, we get these cross terms and these cross terms are purely quantum mechanical. They contain things like the overlap of the height with the top hole times by the overlap of the height with the bottom hole. Um, so that's what's going on in, this, in these cross terms. This is where the quantum mechanics comes in. And so again, just to hammer home, unlike Schrodinger's cat, we don't get 
a single probability out, but a function. We get out on our screen where the photons are going to hit. So the ultimate question then comes, how do we interpret these wave functions? And it turns out that one of the neatest explanations that possibly makes the most sense is to say that these wave functions that contain all the information about the systems or all the possible systems added together actually describe a multiverse. So with the, say, the photon traveling through the slits, it appears as though there was more than one photon, even if we only fired one photon at a time. So it, it, it looked like there's some interference, but we know that there was only one photon because we only fired one photon and the photon could only have traveled through either the top hole or the bottom hole. So rather than there being multiple photons, we say maybe there are multiple existences. And every time the universe has to make a decision, it splits. And it, the ratio it splits in is according to those one over square roots of twos in the equation for the wave function. So these universes would have exactly the same physics as ours. Um, they, so they'd be very similar to the level one universes in many ways. So what do we find ourselves living in? Well, every single time the universe splits, we just so happen to find ourselves living in one of those splits. And those parallel universes sort of interfere with one another. And that's what gives the funny patterns. So this idea of the called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics was originally developed by someone called Hugh Everett. And it was, he, he basically developed it in his PhD thesis. Um, and at the time it was kind of ridiculed. People didn't pay attention to it and said it was obviously a load of nonsense. So Hugh Everett left physics and went on to do other things that probably are far more useful to humanity in the shorter term than worrying about whether there are parallel universes or not. And he had a very successful life and, and a happy life. Um, but it wasn't until decades later that people actually revisited his ideas and thought, no, he was onto something. And actually, this is probably one of the neatest ways of thinking about quantum mechanics. And indeed, if you speak to lots of particle physicists or theoretical physicists, this is the way that many of them interpret these equations. It's what many of them think that they mean. Every time the universe has to make some kind of quantum decision, just another load of infinite universes are spawned in ratios given by these wave functions. Okay, so that was all of the maths equations that I'm gonna give you. Let's briefly move on to the level four parallel universes, which for want of a better name, I've called other mathematical structures. So earlier I showed you this picture of these two mugs that govern the physics of our entire universe. They, they explain how our universe works. And I talked about there being a fine tuning problem because I said that there are about 35 constants that you have to put in, that you have to set the values of in these equations to get our universe out. Um, there's another fine tuning problem. Why these equations and not some other set of equations? So let's briefly just a little side note to say what when we talk of mathematics, mathematicians tend to think of it differently to the rest of us normal people. Most of us, when we think of maths, we think of numbers, we think of some equations, maybe a graph or two. Lots of mathematicians think of maths as abstract symbols and rules for manipulating them. The fun bit for mathematicians is then finding more complicated relationships between the symbols um, from the more basic ones that they started with. And this is called a mathematical structure. On the next slide, um, is the mathematical structure of our universe. For some reason, our universe is governed by mathematics. Nobody knows why, um, but this is the mathematical structure of our universe. So at the bottom, we have the basic maths that you go in, that goes in and, and things get more complicated. And at the top, on the left, we have general relativity, which is the mug on the right. And, and on, on the right-hand side, we have the quantum, quantum field theory, which is the mug on the left. Um, I personally prefer the mugs to this, so let's go back to the mugs. Um, so the idea of this level four multiverse is that maybe all possible mathematical structures which enable self-aware observers to exist do indeed exist 
as a universe. And these universes are in principle vastly different to our own in every and any way that is mathematically possible. So people have actually used this to argue in favor of God existing. So they've said, okay, if all imaginable universes exist, there must be at least one with an all powerful God and that God can therefore insert themselves into all the other structures as well because they're all powerful. Therefore, God exists in our universe. The level four multiverse actually doesn't imply this at all. Um, it says that only mathematically possible universes exist. And we can imagine things that um, are not mathematically possible. They're not mathematically defined and therefore don't correspond to mathematical structures. And indeed, proving um, the, the consistency of structures is difficult and not always possible. And there's an entire industry of thousands of mathematicians around the world inventing new structures and proving whether they exist or not. So then very briefly, I'm going to introduce a couple of extensions to the hierarchy, which are some ideas that I think don't get the full attention that they really deserve. And the first one is the idea of computer simulations. Some of you may have heard of the computer game called The Sims. It's a game where you can build a town, fill it with people, give them jobs, put some furniture, decorate your house. It's incredibly addictive. That is basically a universe. It's a relatively simple one, but it's governed by mathematical rules that the computer programmer set. You could start multiple versions of The Sims running on your computer, and to all intents and purposes, you therefore have several parallel universes running on your computer. And if you're a good enough coder, you could go in and change the source code that governs how these universes work. Um, and actually, we don't. We may well live in a computer simulation right now. Um, sort of ideas about the Matrix um, and things, which can be scary if you think about them for too long. And then finally, the last little thing I wanted to talk about was extra spatial dimensions, which we've already talked about a little bit, but it's worth just kind of really pulling out some of the really interesting ideas. Let's imagine we lived in a 2D universe, again, because it's easier to think in 2D than 3D, and then you can sit and think about it for some time underneath the tree with a glass of wine. Um, in a 2D universe, we could move forwards and backwards, left and right, but not up or down. And if another plane of existence um, existed just one millimeter above the other, you would never know, you wouldn't be able to get to it because you can't travel in this third dimension. Unless you could somehow launch yourself off of your plane into another parallel universe. So then if you extend that to 3D, you have to imagine our three dimensional universe floating around in, in say four dimensions. And if you wanted to look that up, there's plenty of things on Google about it. Google brain multiverse, so that's B-R-A-N-E, not brain in your head. Um, and so this, as I said, relates to some ideas we've touched on, but I think it's important to draw out. So thank you very much for listening. And I think that my conclusions are that Lots of physical theories give rise to parallel universes just as byproducts. And at least one of these theories might be right. If it is, we get parallel universes. Even if they aren't, we could be living in a computer simulation anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luke. That was absolutely incredible. To, to say that you've given us all a lot to think about, I think is the understatement of the age of the universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> um, now, I, I already messed up the entire process by that I was supposed to say that if anybody had any questions, could they please put them in the chat to the side, which, of course, you know, before we'd even started, I got wrong. So if anybody does have any questions, could you please put them to the chat in the side? And due to the delay, what's going to happen is somebody's going to feed them to me and then I'm going to read them out uh, to Luke. Um, so we, we did have one question that came up, which was from Julia S., can one person from a universe one reach the identical person in identical universe two, or is this an improbable event? So Julia, very good question. It depends on which kind of parallel universes we're talking about. If we talk about the level one patchwork universe, um, the identical version of you is probably a very long way away. So you'd have to get in a spaceship and travel for an unimaginably large amount of time. So that's probably, that's not really an option. Your know, other is to try and find a shortcut, to try and find a wormhole. Um, so you can, general relativity tells us that space and time can be bent around and you can, you can basically take shortcuts. So if somehow you could build a wormhole, you could get there in a shortcut. And wormholes require exotic matter that we do not know if it exists in order to build one. Um, and some particle physicists spend their time trying to find evidence of whether this stuff exists or not. So that's 
that's kind of like one option. You could be lucky. Maybe we are lucky and those incredible odds, we've won them. And there is an identical Earth to our own just a few hundred light years away, in which case that's a much more achievable goal. With the bubble universes, probably not. I don't really know how you would jump from one bubble universe to another. Who knows? Um, the quantum mechanics one, again, I don't think you could probably jump between parallel universes that are made as the universe splits every time it has to make a decision. And the mathematical structures one, if you did, you could well end up jumping to a universe that you couldn't exist in and you just instantly die. So you wouldn't want to risk that one. Um, with the planes of parallel universes, you, so if there's some extra dimensions, if you could give yourself a big kick of energy, then that might be a way of launching yourself through one of these extra dimensions that we don't normally experience. The danger is you don't know where you're going. Most of us wouldn't jump off a, jump off a ledge if we didn't know there was somewhere to land. And so randomly firing yourself in some random direction is kind of like jumping off a ledge and not know if there's somewhere to land. So you could risk it um, and maybe it'd be a marvelous experience and maybe you just spend the rest of your existence tumbling through some multi-dimensional space, um, wishing you hadn't done it. So you wouldn't recommend it, I think is the take home message from that then. I think so. <laughs> um, so Fran Woodcock has asked, um, are there any practical applications of this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, was it Fran, sorry? Fran? Um, so, okay, my answer to that is going to be, we don't know, but I would guess at some point, yes. Let's take the classic example of the electric light bulb. Before electric light bulbs, people had gas lanterns and you would spend a lifetime trying to make a better gas lantern and you would never invent a light bulb. You require people playing with magnets and wires to figure some things out. You require some chemists playing with some random gases to figure out how you could make an inert chamber that things weren't burning. You require people doing pure science to, to discover some new things that result in a complete change in the way we live our lives. And so similarly, wondering about whether parallel universes exist, I can't tell you right now how it might impact on our day-to-day -day existences in the future, but I would put very good money on it doing so because history has shown us that every area of science that we, that we explore, we find new things out and that, that we make technical, technological advances as a result that we could never have predicted. So I don't know is the answer, but I would bet yes. Excellent. Um, so Demelza Abbott Scott has asked, have people done experiments with the macroscopic version of the double slit experiment? I, I hope she means just sort of like with tennis balls rather than with people. <laughs> <laughs> so people have done it with molecules and I don't know what the largest molecule people have gotten up to. I think that they might have done it with Buckminster Fullerenes. I, wow. I don't know, Dan. Yeah, so I think they, they've done it with fairly hefty molecules. Um, don't quote me on the Buckminster Fullerenes. I might be wrong on that. But yes, indeed, you see this pattern with, with molecules. That's the biggest people have gotten up to. Um, if you wanted to do it with a human, you'd basically have to make slits that are um, not very much larger than the Planck distance, which is the smallest distance that kind of makes any sense. So you'd have to have incredibly narrow slits to do this with human beings. Um, so the bigger something gets, the more difficult it is to do this experiment with. Fair enough. Um, so Ming Li Alsop Lim has asked, uh, you have described parallel universes being created at decision events. Is there any concept that relates to universes combining again? Good question. <laughs> Yeah, that is a very good question. And actually, so yes, um, so the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is is, a, is is absolutely bonkers. Every interpretation of quantum mechanics is absolutely bonkers. But yes, indeed, you can end up with parallel universes splitting and joining back together again. <laughs> is that like uh, Avengers Endgame then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> Um, I wish I was in a parallel universe where that movie didn't exist. Oh, ouch. This is, where, this is where everyone stops listening to the, to the <laughs> question and answer session. We can continue this offline. Um, and someone who is too embarrassed to name themselves wants to ask whether teleportation can be a real thing. Uh, tele teleportation absolutely is a real thing. There is, there is no need to be embarrassed by that question. And indeed, we can tele teleport very tiny systems already. The difficulty comes if you wanted to teleport anything much bigger than an atom. Um, so teleporting people a la Star Trek is 
a very long way away. I, I, I doubt, <laughs> I don't know what time scale that would happen, but indeed we can, we can teleport atoms already. Excellent. Um, and Fiona Jack has asked, what do you think precipitates the paradigm shifts? Is it just random in your view? The paradigm shift. So does Fiona mean uh, the interpretations of quantum mechanics? Um, there's various things. I think that one of them is the more you think about some ideas, the more you realize they're just too ridiculous. So you almost want to pick what is the simplest interpretation you can come up with. So some of the alternative, or the, the alternative at the time for the many worlds, pardon me, interpretation of quantum mechanics is something called the Copenhagen interpretation. And that says that the wave functions do this thing called collapsing when someone observes them. So let's ignore the fact that a wave function collapsing what does that even mean? You then introduce this idea of observers. So what counts as an observer? And so that almost introduces even more problems. And actually saying that there's an infinite number of universes, isn't that complicated in addition, right? Already we've said with the level one universe, level one parallel universes, if the universe is infinitely big, there are an infinite number of identical versions of us and an infinite number of versions that are just ever so slightly different. So it's almost like, taking all of those level one parallel universes and just sort of like stacking them together and saying another load of them are made anytime something happens. So, so if you think about things, they can just start, you start to realize that the explanation doesn't make sense or it just introduces more problems than it's worth. So you ditch it and go to one that <laughs> doesn't introduce as many problems. Awesome. Um, can I ask a question as well? Go for it. Um, when you were talking about inflation, yeah. How do we know that the universe started at a very small point and then suddenly expanded to the size of a pink grapefruit and didn't just start at the size of a pink grapefruit? Yeah, okay, right. So I guess in principle, the universe could just pop into existence exactly as it was after cosmic inflation happened. But that's weird, right? So you're, you're then like, ideally, we want the universe to be simple. The physics and maths have shown us that. Um, we, we're able to sort of explain things with science in a simpler way than we could otherwise. So if you sort of like invoke a God, that's more complicated than saying there are some equations. So we know the universe is expanding because we see it's expanding today. When we look out, we see distant objects are moving away from us and the further they are away, the faster they're moving away. That means our universe is expanding. And in fact, the expansion rate is speeding up. So if you play the expansion backwards, it means originally it was a lot hotter and a lot denser than it was today. And then you can do the maths as to what those hot, dense universes must have been like. And you get out things that explain our universe. So our universe is mainly hydrogen, a bit of helium, a small amount of lithium, and then a tiny amount of all the other elements in the periodic table. If you trace back a very hot, dense early universe, it predicts that you would produce elements in basically the exact ratios we see them in. Um, so all the evidence says the universe must have used to have been very hot and dense. And then the problem comes, how do you seed the fluctuations that go on to evolve to become galaxies and planets? Um, you need slight over or under densities to, to collapse, to form galaxies and things. And unless you just want to say the universe popped into being exactly as it needed to be when it was a tiny fraction of a second old, you need a method to get there. And cosmic inflation by saying the universe expands faster than the speed of light does that, I guess. The follow-up question to that would be, how do we know the universe didn't just pop into existence half a second ago with all our memories fully formed of everything that happened earlier in our lives? Um, so yes, you could assert that, um, but is it testable? I don't know. And I don't think it's, I don't know how helpful it is if you want to try and predict things scientifically. So it's a very good question that I'm just gonna try and ignore because I can't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> See, my follow-up question was actually going to be, well, don't you need the universe to pop into existence as something smaller than an atom anyway? Um, and yeah. is the thing that is smaller than an atom completely homogenous, and therefore inflation gives you this inhomogeneity? Or did you actually require the thing that was a smaller than atom to be inhomogenous to begin with? So the idea is before inflation, it was completely smooth and the same everywhere. So it's completely homogenous. Um, but quantum mechanics tells us that fundamentally, on the, sm the smallest distance scales, the universe is random. Some bits bubble up and just randomly have a bit more energy, and some bubble down and have a bit less. Um, but sort of generally, it is, it is smooth, other than these very tiny distance scale fluctuations. 
by expanding the universe faster than the speed of light, you stretch out those quantum fluctuations. So you stretch out the inherent randomness of the universe on tiny little scales that don't otherwise enable you to do anything. And you turn them into over densities and under densities in your pink grapefruit universe, which can then go on to evolve to become the universe today. Excellent answer. All right, so one last question. Um, Duncan McCormick has asked, could two bubble universes with different physical constants or a different fine structure constant collide if both are expanding? And if so, what would happen? Yeah, they could. I have no idea what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can do some looking through the academic literature later and see if we can see if people have done something to work out what would happen. I don't know what would happen. <laughs> Excellent. Very scientific answer there. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm afraid that we've uh, come to the end of our allotted time. Thank you so very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I could discuss this all day. Uh, the um, video of this will remain available. So if anybody missed the start, they can go back and watch it again if they'd like to. But initially, I'd like to ask everybody if they would like to move on to what's going to be our second event today, which is going to be starting at four o'clock, which is when Philip Pullman uh, we'll be discussing possibly his version of parallel universes uh, and, and how to incorporate them into literature. The link for that is going to be available in the chat below this talk, but it's also on the St Hilda's website if you are looking for it there. And I think um, I'm just going to check what I need to do. Yep, that's all that was required. Thank you again very much, Luke. Um, have a good Thank day. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Cheers. All right.